Nice to meet you, everyone. So before I share those examples from my class, I want, want us to think about why we care about active learning anyway. We can start by thinking about what is the opposite of active learning. Well, it can be thought of as a passive learning and actually you, the traditional form of uh, just 100% lecturing in front of the class it can be considered as a passive learning maybe. So I, I ran into this data showing the student retention rate depending on which mechanism was used for their learning. So, and unfortunately it seems like when students are just lectured about something passively, whether or not they wants to learn. So in that case, it seems like the retention rate was less than 10%. And then, when we start engaging readings and audiovisual demonstrations, it, it starts going up, up to about 30%. However, they do not beat those active learning components, uh, which include discussions or practice doing actual, actual problem solving and even teaching others. It can be also through presentation or by project, etc. So high retention rate is definitely the most important benefit of active learning. But other than that, we also expect higher student engagement during the class time. Also, it provides us an easy tool to check student status and adjust our course pace depending on how students are receiving the materials. Also, active learning components usually encourage peer interaction, so students are less feeling isolated. Let's think about what is active learning. It is a method of instruction that promotes student participation in their learning process. And naturally, it involves some sort of interactions with others in completing some well-defined tasks or deliverables. And this interaction includes interaction among peers, it could be interaction between student and the instructor. Also, it could be an interaction between student and some other media. It could be a handout, or it could be an app on their phone. I try to kind of collect all those different sorts of active learnings that we encounter in our courses. And I sorted them in the level of prep needed. It's just a rough, rough sorting, in my opinion. And we can see a very wide spectrum of active learning. Maybe all of you already are practicing some of these active learning in, in one way or the other. So starting from a low level of preparation needed, you can just pause in the middle of your lecture after covering an important concept after deriving certain long equation, you may decide to pause a little bit. I'm gonna give you three minutes to think about it and make catch up note taking or think about any questions you wanna ask. And then you can wait for them to take in knowledge and then ask you the question. So answering questions asked by students, that will be the most basic level, which doesn't actually require any prep. However, it still very helps uh, with the uh, interaction with the student. And then you may also kind of prepare some kind of questions that you will ask to the students. It can be highly related to certain topic in your, in your course. Polling or surveying, it requires very little prep, but it's also another great tool to engage students and prevent them from trailing off from the track. So, Polling can also have a wide spectrum. It can be as small, as simple as show of hands. How many of you th think this is true or not? iClicker is an, another amazing tool. A survey about muddy point. What is the, uh, what is the most unclear thing from, uh, from today's course? You can ask that question at the end of the class or anytime in the middle of the class. It could be asked on Canvas or, or in class with a piece of, papers as well. Short discussion time given to the student, that can be another uh, way to incorporate active learning. In this case, you may uh, pull up that discussion question on the screen so that students are focused on that topic. You may also give students some time to solve certain problems or certain part of the problems. Maybe this could be the second example, right after you show them 
one one example problem, you may give them time to solve the, solve it by themselves, and it can be just individual uh, individual student taking time by themselves and thinking about the core procedures. You may also use handouts with some of the blanks in there for them to fill out as they go through the course, go through a class. It's maybe a appropriate for highly theoretical class, which involves a lot of equations and de uh, de derivations. And this way, you can give them guidance on what is the core equation and what are uh, less important. And the last three things requires a little more prep if you want them to solve problems as a group. So there are two different ways for group problem solving. You may you may let them solve problem with any partners. It can be changing every time. It can be your close friend or somebody sitting next to you. That is a little bit easier because you don't have to keep track of who is uh, getting the same score with the other. And then, however, for other cases, you may want them to stay with the same group member for a certain number of weeks. This is what I use for my flipped classroom. And when they turn in the group activity sheet, they're getting the same score. So I am managing their group and I assign the groups. And I, I found it helpful that students have formed the stable learning community uh, that they can resort to when they have questions outside of the class. And later on, heist prep needed could be the prep project or presentation, which certainly always helps. Okay, then now let me show you some of these example forms of active learning I have in my class. So let's say that hypothetically, I just lectured you about Bernoulli's equation, how this is derived and what are the assumptions attached to it, when it's applicable and when it's not. Okay, in that context, I would probably bring up a poll, something like this. Um, it could be casted in eye clicker form, but I, in a simplest format, I would just bring up these, these pictures on the screen and then ask them, do you think you can apply Bernoulli's, Bernoulli's equation? And then I, I may just ask them to uh, show of hand. How many of you think it's yes for the case one? How many of you think it's no for case one? Things like that can be done uh, quickly right after covering certain topic. And then I might get into example problem solving. And then when I'm doing that, I always make it interactive. So even before I take any note on whiteboard or on uh, iPad, I would understand the problem together with the students, read it out together, take time to understand the problem together. And then even when I'm starting to just analyze the schematic, given schematic, I would ask questions like this. Okay, what will be your choice for those locations for point one and point two required for Bernoulli's equation? And then I'll ask why it's, it should be picked uh, here and there and not at the outlet of the nozzle. So I'm giving them another opportunity to think about how to approach the problems first. And then maybe after writing the general form of the equation, I might ask uh, if they understand each of the terms correctly by asking things like this. Who thinks these pressure terms are gauge pressure or who thinks these are absolute pressures? And actually either is fine as long as they are consistent. So this is another question that can be asked or when I'm dealing with a lot of terms canceling in connection to assumptions, before I do that on the board, I always wait for students to think about it and then ask them what terms you think will be canceling out. After doing all this analysis, I may have a question for reflection. So is it, we assume this problem was a steady and we solved it based on that assumption, but is this actually steady? Does this assumption, is this only valid for a certain time point? And those are things, another good wrap up question. So these are kind of brainstormed ideas, assuming that I'm teaching this topic. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't implement all of these into one, one topic in my class, but there can be some different forms of active engagement you can implement you know, in delivering some concept theory and an example problem. And let me talk about how I do some in-class problem solving. So this is an example of group activity sheet that each group 
grab from the front of the class. And I let only, I let them grab only one sheet per group. It can be two people or three people, depending on the situation. So they write their name and then start working on this specific part, uh, specific part indicated by blue, blue font. So the black font indicates the full problem. Sometimes I do not have time for solving the entire problem, including calculation. So I let them focus on setting up the procedure and then focus on just core analysis steps and then just skip the calculation part. So I usually hint them with what is the deliverable at the end by this box and then the blue part. So they are only focusing on this uh, core part. And before they actually get into this discussion, I may have some kind of questions like this to have another discussion with the partner. Why do you expect cavitation with higher age? The problem is asking for the minimum age, which means that for higher age, higher height, there is higher possibility of cavitation. I want them to understand why it is like that first before even solving the problem. And then I could also give them time for discussion again and then do a poll for which cases you think will be more likely to have cavitation. So this is how I usually set up the in-class problem solving. I think this cues or the blue font and boxes kind of help them knowing what to do during this time. And then this semester, and for the first time, I am offering a flipped classroom as an in-person mode. It has been online mode. And this is how I utilize both space and time for my flipped classroom. So for problem solving during the flipped classroom, I usually start by reviewing the related theory and then understand the given problem with everybody together. And then I give them time to work on the worksheet just like the example that you saw. And then the wrap up time is really critical. So as a whole class, this is a time students can ask me a lot of questions as a whole group. Of course, they can they all, all the time ask the questions during the group session, but I check with them about any remaining questions. They share some thought processes for core analysis. They share parts that they got stuck. And sometimes I ask them some what, what, what they got as intermediate answers. They also share easy to make mistakes with other people so that we can prevent those same mistakes for, from other people. So I use this wrap up time to really give students chance to talk so that I can figure out which are some areas that needs more enforcement by me. So during the group problem solving time, I started bringing, inviting students to the board. So on the whiteboard, I always locate two of the groups working problems on the board. And it really helped me kind of doing this wrap up session because I already have those draft of analysis written out. Sometimes the groups are making very common mistakes. It is nice to have them available on the board for the preparation of wrap-up session and groups rotate turns to solve problems in the front. And I use this picket card. I let them grab one of these picket cards per group and then sit with their group members. So they usually grab this with the activity sheet in the beginning of the class and they just sit with their group members. So this is a screen showing uh, what students have drawn on the board. So for the first class of this semester, I let all the groups come up to the front and then report their answers to this free body diagram problem, which they worked on as a worksheet zero. It's just not counted for grade, but they just worked on this activity to get, get warmed up. So lastly, I just want to show you this list of success strategies that I thought of. So at the present preparation step, please start by making time for active learning. Sometimes I have to prioritize course contents and think about some, some other way of delivering some less important concepts through reading or like a short video recorded instead of covering all of those concepts during the class. That way I could make some time, I could resolve some time for student engagement and active learning. Also, don't forget to build a strong connection between 
lecture content immediately preceding the active learning components and then the active learnings. So you can do this by thoughtful timing of your active learning. I usually do the active learning problem solving for the second example problem. And then right after covering important concepts or theory, I usually ask questions related to that. Also during the active learning, it is important to clearly communicate your expectations. What is expected at the end of this time? So that's why I use this cues of blue font and the, and the boxes. If it's a discussion question, I would have the question shown on the screen so that students are fully focused on that question and know what to come up with at the end. At first, when I'm trying to engage, engage students, I made the mistake of casting a question, asking a question, and then answering it by myself. I, I was just not waiting enough. So waiting enough really helped. Set the, set the environment that everybody is really chiming in in answering the, any questions that I pose. And sometimes it helped when I said, I want to hear from at least three people about this. And then students kind of know that there's a, another chance to talk. And then during the problem solving time, I always walk around and kind of uh, interact with students, asking them what their status is like. And it's really valuable time for me to see how they're doing. I found it helpful when students are working with the same people for three to four weeks for group workshop. The, the group engagement was higher when they're staying together. And when I, when I formed the group, it seemed to work better than letting students forming the group. It seemed like it worked better if they submit something, even a little bit for participation credit as a result of active learning. Okay, thank you for listening. Hope this was helpful.